Good afternoon, everybody. Aloha. Uh, I want to begin by uh, thanking the people of Hawaii for their extraordinary hospitality. Uh, usually when Michelle and I and our daughters come back to visit, it's just one present, and this time we brought 21. So uh, thank you so much for uh, the incredible graciousness of uh, the people of Hawaii uh, and their patience because I know that the uh, traffic got tied up a little bit. Now, the single greatest challenge for the United States right now, and my highest priority as president, is creating jobs and putting Americans back to work. And one of the best ways to do that is to increase our trade and exports with other nations. 95% of the world's consumers are beyond our borders. I want them to be buying goods with three words stamped on made in America. So I've been doing everything I can to make sure that the United States is competing aggressively for the jobs and markets of the future. No region will do more to shape our long-term economic future than the Asia-Pacific region. As I've said, the United States is and always will be a Pacific nation. Many of our top trading partners are in this region. This is where we sell most of our exports, supporting some five million American jobs. And since this is the world's fastest growing region, the Asia Pacific is key to achieving my goal of doubling U.S. exports, a goal, by the way, which we are on track right now to meet. And that's why I've been proud to host APEC this year. It's been a chance to help lead the way towards a more seamless regional economy with more trade, more exports, and more jobs for our people. And I'm pleased that we've made progress in three very important areas. First, we agreed to a series of steps that will increase trade and bring our economies even closer. We agreed to a new set of principles on innovation to encourage the entrepreneurship that creates new businesses and new industries. With simplified customs and exemptions from certain tariffs, we'll encourage more businesses to engage in more trade. And that includes our small businesses, which account for the vast majority of the companies in our economies. We agreed to a new initiative that will make it easier and faster for people to travel and conduct business across the region. And yesterday, I was pleased to sign legislation, uh, a new travel card that will help our American businessmen and women travel more easily and get deals done in this region. Uh, I note that we also made a lot of progress increasing trade on the sidelines of APEC. Uh, as I announced yesterday, the United States and our eight partners reached the broad outlines of an agreement on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And today I'm pleased that Japan, Canada, and Mexico have now expressed an interest in this effort. This comes on the heels of our landmark trade agreements with South Korea, Panama, and Colombia, which will support tens of thousands of American jobs. And in my meeting with President Medvedev, we discussed how to move ahead with Russia's accession to the WTO which will also mean more exports for American manufacturers and American farmers and ranchers. Second, <laughs> APAC agreed on ways to promote the green growth we need for our energy security. We agreed to reduce tariffs on environmental goods and make it easier to export clean energy technologies that create green jobs. We raised the bar on ourselves and will aim for even higher energy efficiencies. And we're moving ahead with the effort to phase out fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, this would be a huge step toward creating clean energy economies and fighting climate change, which is a threat to both the beauty and the prosperity of the region. Third, we're redoubling our efforts to make sure that regulations are encouraging trade and job creation, not discouraging trade and job creation. And this builds on the work that we're doing in the United States to get rid of rules and regulations that are unjustified and that are overly burdensome. Our APAC partners are joining us in streamlining and coordinating regulations so that we're sparking innovation and growth, even as we protect public health and our environment. And finally, since many of the leaders here were also at the recent G20 summit, we continued our efforts to get the global economy to grow faster. APAC makes up more than half the global economy and it will continue to play a key role in achieving the strong and balanced growth that we need. As I've said, as the world's largest economy, the best thing that the United States can do 
for the global economy is to grow our own economy faster. And so I will continue to fight for the American Jobs Act so that we can put our people back to work. I was glad to see the Congress move forward on one aspect of the jobs bill, uh, tax credits for companies that are hiring veterans. Uh, but we've got to do a lot more than that. So again, I want to thank the people of Hawaii for their extraordinary hospitality and for all that they've done to help make this summit such a success. I want to thank my fellow leaders for the seriousness and sense of common purpose that they brought to our work. And I believe that the progress we made here will help create jobs and keep America competitive, a region that is absolutely vital, not only for our economy, but also for our national security. So with that, I'm going to take uh, a few questions. I'll start with Ben Feller. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I picked a sun in the sun here, so um, I'd like to ask you about Iran. Did you get any specific commitments from Russia or China on tightening sanctions? Did you move them at all? And do you fear the world is, is running out of options short of military intervention to keep Iran from getting nuclear weapons? One of the striking things over the last uh, three years since I came into office is the degree of unity that we've been able to forge in the international community uh, with respect to Iran. And when I came into office, the world was divided and Iran was unified around this nuclear program. Uh, we now have a situation where the world is united and Iran is isolated. Uh, and because of our diplomacy and our efforts, we have by far the strongest sanctions on Iran. Uh, that we've ever seen. And China and Russia were critical to making that happen. Had they not been willing uh, to uh, support those efforts in the United Nations, uh, we would not be able to see the kind of progress that we've made. And they're having an impact. All our intelligence indicates that Iran's economy is suffering as a consequence of this. And we're also seeing that Iran's influence in the region uh, has ebbed, uh, in part because their uh, approach to repression inside of Iran is contrary to the Arab Spring that has been sweeping the Middle East. Uh, so we are in a much stronger position now than we were two or three years ago with respect to Iran. Having said that, uh, the recent IAE report uh, indicates uh, what we already knew, which is uh, although Iran does not possess a nuclear weapon and is uh, you know, technically still allowing IAEA uh, observers uh, into their country, uh, that uh, they are engaging in a series of practices that are contrary to their international obligations and their IAE obligations. And that's what the IAE report indicated. Uh, so what uh, I did was to speak with President Medvedev, uh, as well as uh, President Hu, and all three of us entirely agree on the objective, which is making sure that Iran does not weaponize nuclear power, and that we don't trigger a nuclear arms race uh, in the region. That's in the interest of all of us. Uh, in terms of how we move forward, uh, we will be con uh, consulting with them carefully over the next uh, several weeks uh, to uh, look at what other options we have available to us. The sanctions have enormous bite and enormous scope, and we're building off the platform uh, that uh, has already been established. Uh, the question is, are there additional uh, measures that we can take? And we're going to explore every avenue to see if we can solve this issue diplomatically. Uh, I have said repeatedly, and I will uh, say today, uh, we are not taking any options off the table because it's my firm belief that uh, Iran with a nuclear weapon would pose a security threat not only to the region but also to the United States. Uh, but uh, our strong preference is to have Iran meet its international obligations, uh, negotiate diplomatically to allow them to have uh, peaceful use of nuclear energy uh, in accordance with uh, international law, uh, but at the same time, forswear uh, the weaponization of uh, nuclear power. So we're going to keep on pushing on that. And China and Russia have the same aims, the same objectives, and I believe that we'll continue to cooperate uh, and collaborate closely on that issue. Uh, Dan Logan.
Thank, Thank you, Mr. President. President. Last, Last night at the uh, Republican, Republican debate, they, some of the uh, hopefuls, they hope to get your job, they defended the practice of waterboarding, which is a practice that you banned in 2009. Herman Cain said, quote, I don't see that as torture. Michelle Bachman said that it's, quote, very effective. So I'm wondering if you think that they're uninformed, out of touch, or irresponsible. That's a multiple choice, choice question, question, isn't it? <laughs> Let, Let me just say this, they're wrong. Waterboarding is torture. It's contrary to America's traditions. It's contrary to our ideals. That's not who we are. That's not how we operate. We don't need it in order to prosecute the war on terrorism. And we did the right thing by ending that practice. If we want to lead around the world, part of our leadership is setting a good example. And anybody who's actually uh, read about uh, and understands uh, the practice of waterboarding would say that that is torture. And that's not something we do. Period. Nor not. Thank you, Mr. President. If I could continue on that, the Republicans did have a debate on CBS last night. A lot of it was about foreign policy and they were very critical of your record. That's shocking. So if I could get you to respond to something that uh, Mitt Romney said. He said your biggest foreign policy failure is Iran. He said that if you are reelected, Iran will have a nuclear weapon. Is Mitt Romney wrong? You know, I am going to make a practice of not commenting on uh, whatever is said in Republican debates until they've got uh, an actual nominee. Uh, but as I indicated uh, to Ben uh, in the earlier question, uh, you take a look at what we've been able to accomplish uh, in mobilizing the world community uh, against Iran uh, over the last three years, and uh, it shows steady, determined, firm progress in isolating uh, the Iranian regime and sending a clear message that the world believes uh, it would be dangerous for them to have a nuclear weapon. Um, now, is this an easy issue? Uh, no. Anybody who claims it is, uh, is either politicking or doesn't know what they're talking about. But. I think not only the world, but the Iranian regime understands very clearly uh, how determined we are uh, to prevent not only a nuclear Iran, but also a nuclear arms race in the region. Uh, and a violation of uh, non-proliferation norms that would have uh, implications uh, around the world, including uh, in the Asia-Pacific region, where uh, we have similar problems with North Korea. David Nakamura. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, yesterday, uh, in a speech before business leaders, you said that uh, you want China to play by the rules. Uh, and then your staff later said that in a bilateral meeting with President Hu, that you expressed that uh, American business leaders are growing um, frustrated with the pace of change in China's economy. What rules is China not playing by? What specific steps do you need to see from China? And what uh, punitive actions is your administration willing to take, as you said it would yesterday, if China does not play by the rules? Well, first of all, uh, I also said yesterday that uh, we welcome the peaceful rise of China. It is in America's interest to see uh, China succeed uh, in lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Uh, China can be a source of stability and uh, help to underwrite international norms and codes of conduct. Uh, and so you know, what we've done over the 